Welcome uh, to the MGH Brain PBM uh, uh, clinic round. Uh, um, I'm uh, Paolo Cassano. Today is April 9th, uh, 2021, and it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Linda Chow, a PhD and uh, a professor uh, of neurology at uh, UCSF. Uh, the presentation today will be about self administered transcranial PBM treatments for Gulf War illness. Uh, and concussion. Uh, Linda, uh, thank you for coming. It's, uh, it's a great honor and please take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I apologize about the date. <laughs> I'm a, a little bit uh, ahead of myself here. Okay, so today I'm going to tell you about uh, some of my pilot studies, as Paolo mentioned, looking at self-administered transcranial PBM treatments for Gulf War illness and concussion. I'll start with Gulf War illness and because most people aren't that familiar with Gulf War illness. I'll give you a little bit of background about what that is. So the Gulf War happened over 30 years ago when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990. This invasion triggered a series of events that eventually led to the Persian Gulf War, which started <clears throat> with a massive US-led air offensive in early 1991. After six weeks of airstrikes, the ground troops went in there were 37 countries in the Allied coalition and about 700,000 US troops. After four days of ground combat, the Iraqis fled Kuwait and a ceasefire was declared. Because the Gulf War lasted less than two months and there were relatively few casualties, the war was initially thought of as a decisive victory. But shortly after veterans came home, they began to complain of symptoms that weren't adequately explained by familiar medical or psychiatric diagnoses. The symptoms varied somewhat from veteran to veteran, but they generally include some combination of fatigue, pain, memory and concentration problems, respiratory problems, sleep, GI, skin problems, and mood changes. So this constellation of symptoms has been called many things over the years from Go for syndrome, go for illness, go for veterans illness, unexplained illness, chronic multi-symptom illness, uh, but they all refer to the same thing, namely a well-documented pattern of symptoms <clears throat> found at significantly higher rates in veterans of the 1991 Persian Gulf War. The symptoms aren't explained by standard lab tests. And as I mentioned earlier, they're also not explained by established medical <clears throat> or psychiatric diagnosis. And sick Gulf War veterans for the most part have not gotten better in the 30 years since the Gulf War ended. The jury's still out on what exactly caused Gulf War illness, but despite its brevity, there was a unique combination of a lot of different toxic substances in the Gulf War, from burning oil well smoke to chemical weapons, to pyridostigmine bromide pills, which was used as a prophylactic to protect against exposures to chemical weapons. There were ammunitions completely containing depleted uranium and a heavy and widespread use of all kinds of different pesticides. The troops also received numerous vaccines because of fear of biological weapons such as anthrax. And there are other exposures and experiences that could potentially have contributed to Gulf War illness. Now, I mentioned earlier that cognitive dysfunction is one of the symptoms of Gulf War illness. And Marnie Nazer, who's on this call and who spoke here last month, had a VA grant investigating the efficacy of transcranial PBM treatments for improving cognitive function in veterans with Gulf War illness. Now, unfortunately, they had problems recruiting enough I mean, veterans for. I'm sorry? Uh, please, uh, is there a um, question? Yeah. Or? Mute, mute yourself, uh, unless you're asking a question, mute yourself, uh, thank you. Okay, so um, Marnie had this VA funded trial at the Boston VA, but um, they were having trouble recruiting enough veterans and that's how I got involved with the study. Um, the program manager at the VA asked if I was interested in being a second site for the clinical trial in San Francisco. I said yes, and, and then Marnie and Paula Martin, who's also on this call, basically flew out to San Francisco and duplicated their setup in my lab, in my lab at the San Francisco VA, which included a custom-built helmet to deliver near-infrared light transcranially to the head. Um, we used MedX devices to deliver near-infrared light to the ears, 
and V-light intranasal devices to deliver both red and near infrared light through the nostrils. So the treatment protocol was about half hour long and the veterans had to come to either the Boston or San Francisco VA twice a week for seven and a half weeks. So in the end, we ended up screening nearly 200 Gulf War veterans by phone. We screened in person and enrolled 96 Gulf War veterans, randomized 63 and ended up with primary outcome data from only 48 Gulf War veterans. The protocol turned out to be kind of hard for the veterans to follow. If they missed a week, they had to start the, the series all over again because Marnie didn't want there to be too much of a gap in between treatments. And we were having a lot of problems with veterans missing a week here or there. And when I saw how portable and easy to use the V-Lite transcranial devices were, I thought that this might be another way to do a similar type of study. Teach veterans how to use the V-Lite transcranial devices, have them take it home and treat themselves there. So I tried a pilot home treatment study I initially picked three Gulf War veterans who uh, had been in part of my other studies. One veteran didn't come up for the follow-up procedure. So that just goes to show you, no matter how easy you try to make the protocol for patients, some just can't follow through. But we got pre and post-treatment data from two veterans and here's their demographic and clinical characteristics. They both met uh, Gulf War illness criteria according to research definition. They were both trauma exposed, but they did not have current PTSD or major depression, and they both had a history of um, alcohol abuse. So um, we trained the veterans how to use the V-Lite transcranial device and then sent them home to use it every other day for three months. Uh, at the beginning and at the end of the three months, we had them fill out questionnaires about their health, mood, and go for illness symptoms. So the questionnaire that I used to query them about their Gulf War illness symptoms, if they endorsed a particular symptom, they had to indicate how severe that symptom is. So in this sense, the questionnaire is a Likert scale. So what I did was I added up all the scores for the Gulf War illness symptoms to derive an overall Gulf War illness symptom severity measure. And then I added up scores for the individual symptom clusters to get severity about those clusters. So here's the data. <clears throat> up here in the <clears throat> upper right-hand corner, I'm showing the overall Gulf War illness severity measure. And you can see that in both veterans, the, their symptom severity decreased after 12 weeks of home PBM treatments. Here are the individual symptom clusters, fatigue, pain, neurological mood and cognitive symptoms, skin, respiratory, and GI symptoms. So veteran one didn't have any pain or skin symptoms, and that's, that's common. Um, to have Gulf War illness, you just need some combination of these symptom clusters. You don't have to have all of them. But what you can notice for both of this, these veterans is that their, their symptoms decreased in severity after 12 weeks of treatment. And what's interesting is that uh, the home PBM treatments also help them to sleep better. So this is the insomnia severity index, uh, as its name implies, it's a measure of how severe insomnia is. This is the Pittsburgh sleep quality index. So it's a subjective measure of sleep quality. For both of these measures, the higher the score, the worse the sleep. So um, PBM, as um, um, a lot of people have reported, can help people sleep better. Linda? And Yes. Excuse me. So these are all self-reported uh, improvements in symptoms. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, this is interesting because I had another treatment study for Gulf War veterans. Um, we in that study we delivered cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia by telephone to the Gulf War veterans, and we found that if we help veterans with Gulf War illness and insomnia sleep better it also alleviates their Gulf War illness symptoms. So in addition to PBM's effects on reducing inflammation, increasing ATP and blood flow, its effects on improving sleep may also be playing a role here in helping to reduce Gulf War illness symptoms. So um, that's the Gulf War illness study. If, uh, <laughs> Uh, are there any questions or should I move on to the next portion and we'll, we can take questions at the end? Okay, so I'll switch gears and tell you about the other pilot study that I had um, dealing with a chronic serial concussion case. 
So I did this study with Lulib and V-Lite Inc. And so how this study came about was there was a professional hockey player who approached them about their transcranial PBM device after he suffered his last concussion. So um, he was a white non-Latino male. He was 22 years old when we saw him at baseline. He had normal psychosocial background and no family history of psychiatric disorders. And medically, he had seasonal allergies. He had suffered a fractured vertebra, broken wrist, and six documented concussions, which were all sustained during hockey games. He also had anisocorrhea, which is a condition where the pupils of the eyes are different sizes. He said that he's had this condition for as long as he could remember. And some people are born with this, but it can also be caused by trauma to the eye and concussion. So as I mentioned earlier, he was a professional hockey player who'd been playing hockey since he was a little kid. So um, it's difficult to say if his anisocorrhea was, um, if he was born with it or if he got it from a blow to the head. He was 17 years old when he started playing hockey professionally. And it was around that time when he got his first documented concussion. Over the next six years, he had five more documented concussions, but he thinks he's probably had more concussions uh, prior to 2013 that weren't documented. He never lost consciousness. So according to the OSU TBI screen, he's classified as a possible TBI. So when he came in at baseline, his symptoms included headaches, which he rated a 76 on the headache impact test scale, which is severe. He also had mild anxiety and he reported difficulty remembering and concentrating. He had previously tried acupuncture, nutritional supplements and hyperbaric oxygen to treat these symptoms. When they didn't really help, he approached v -Lite about their transcranial PBF devices. v -Lite told them that would, they would give him one of their devices and they also asked if he'd be willing to come to the San Francisco VA for cognitive testing and neuroimaging before and after a period of treatment. He agreed and we first saw him in March of 2019. So at baseline, we gave him a battery of neuropsych tests and he also underwent structural MRI, arterial spin labeled perfusion MRI, resting state functional MRI. And then we sent him home with the uh, V-Lite NeuroGamma device to use every other day for eight weeks. So from that point on, he communicated solely with V-Lite about his care, and I didn't see him until uh, follow-up two months later. But I was told that after a week uh, of using the V-Lite NeuroGamma device, which pulses 8, 10 nanometers light at 40 hertz, his headaches got worse. So V-Lite advised him then to switch to the Neuro Alpha device, which pulses 8, 10 nanometers light at 10 hertz. Now, anecdotally, some people have reported that the Gamma is, is a little bit more harsh on the body. I know Marnie has said that she's tried both and the gamma made her feel like she was coming down with a cold. And Lou Lim has said that compared to the alpha, he felt that the gamma made him feel like he had one cup of coffee too many. Anyways, after 10 days, the patient's headaches went away. So v -Light told them to alternate between using the alpha and the gamma device, which he did uh, until he came back two months later for his coffee follow-up cognitive tests and MRI scans. So cognitively, his scores got better after eight weeks of home treatment. So these are his pre and post treatment test scores on the California Verbal Learning Test or the CVLT. And as the name implies, this is a measure of verbal learning and memory. So these are Z scores, so higher scores are better. Now there are five learning trials in the CVLT where the examiner reads a list of 16 words and the subject has to remember the words on the list. So at baseline, the subject scores on the learning trials were all below norm, but after eight weeks of treatment, his scores on the learning trials were at norm or better. Now, immediately after the five learning trials, the examiner reads another list of 16 words, which the subject has to try to remember. After this distractor list, the subject has to recall words from the original list. And there are two kinds of recall trials in the CBLT. Free recall is where the subject has to generate the words from the list on his own. Cued recall is where the subject is cued with categories. So for example, tell me all the animals that were on the list, tell me all the furniture. Now his scores didn't change on free recall before and after treatment. Uh, interestingly, his scores actually got worse on cued recall after treatment. And I'll speculate on why I think this might be later. 
but his scores on recall discriminability got better after eight weeks of treatment. So recall discriminability is the ability to, to distinguish target words from distractor words. So remember that, I'm sorry, does someone have a question? Okay, so in between the um, learning and recall trials, remember subjects are given a distractor list. So sometimes at recall, subjects can get words from the distractor list mixed up with words from the original list. So recall discriminability is a measure of recognition memory accuracy, which got better in this patient after eight weeks of home PBM treatments. Now, the reason why I think his scores on cued recall might have gotten worse after treatment may be related to a lack of effort. So remember this patient had self-reported concentration problems. So it's potentially possible that he didn't try as hard or paid as close attention at the second time point. His scores on cued recall may also be related to his semantic ability his semantic memory ability. So remember that when cued recall, the subjects are cued with categories. So even though this patient's semantic fluency scores also got better after eight weeks of home P PBM treatments, um, he could still only generate 18 animal names in one minute after treatment. And most healthy 20-somethings can generate much more than 20 animal names in a minute. So these are his other neuropsych test scores. These are scaled scores, so higher scores are better. His scores improved on the waist digit span, which is a measure of working memory. The examiner reads a list of numbers and the subject has to repeat those numbers back, sometimes forward, sometimes backwards. So if I said uh, four, three, two, one, the subject would have to say one, two, three, four. His score is improved on the trail making test. Part A is kind of a measure of attention and motor speed. The subject has to connect a bunch of numbered circles. Part B is a measure of set shifting. The subject has to connect the circles alternating between numbers and letters. So set shifting is part of executive function. His verbal fluency also improved after eight weeks of home PBM treatment. So verbal fluency is uh, looking at the ability to come up with words starting with different letters of the alphabet. And as I mentioned, his uh, semantic fluency improved. So in, in this case, semantic fluency, they have to come up with as many animal names as they can in a minute. We also use the DCUFS color word interference test to look at executive function. Again, these are scaled scores, so higher scores are better. So this interference condition here is basically the classic Stroop test where you see colored names printed in different colored ink. And the subject has to name the color of the ink, which may or may not agree with the color name. And so the, the subject got better on this test after eight weeks of treatment. This interference switching condition is another measure of set shifting. So it's basically the Stroop test, except in cases where the colored name appears in a box. In those cases, you don't name the color ink, you just read the name. So you have to switch back and forth between doing two kinds of tasks. And on, on this condition, the subject also got better after eight weeks of treatment. Color naming and word reading are just that. How fast can you name colors and read words? And he got faster after eight weeks of home treatment. So um, what does his brain look like? As is common with a lot of mild TBI cases, it's hard to detect abnormalities on structural MRI. Although for a 22 year old, his ventricles are a little bit bigger than normal. And on this coronal section here, his ventricles appear kind of oblong, um, like um, a lot of boxers ventricles are shaped that way. He also had white matter lesions, which I'm not sure if you can see that well on these, um, on these smaller T2 weighted scans. I used the FreeSurfer software to segment the structural MRIs. And uh, after eight weeks of home PBM treatments, he gained gray matter volume, both cortically and in subcortical structures. Um, FreeSurfer also has a hippocampal subfield segmentation algorithm, um, which separates um, the different seg subfields of the hippocampus. And after eight weeks of home PBM treatments, the subjects subiculum, CA1, CA2, and 3, uh, the area in between the hippocampus and amygdala and his fimbria got bigger, and his hippocampal fissure got smaller. 
we used arterial spin labeled MRI to measure, measure cerebral perfusion. So this imaging method uses radio frequency pulses to label protons in the arterial blood. And I use the freezer for ROIs to quantify perfusion in the cortical gray matter, in different lobes of the brain and in the hippocampus. And after eight weeks of treatment, there was more blood flow in the cortex overall, as well as in the frontal, temporal and occipital lobe and also in the hippocampus. Linda? Yep. I have a question. How, how sensitive are these perfusion studies for subcortical ischemia? Um, I am not sure, but when we, um, I, I, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so finally, we, we also looked at resting state functional connectivity. So previous resting state fMRI studies of mild TBI patients have reported increases both in the number and in the strength of connections between the medial prefrontal cortex and other regions of the brain relative to healthy controls. So that's why I placed the seed in the anterior cingulate cortex, which you can see with this yellow circle here. So before treatment, his anterior cingulate cortex was functionally connected with a lot of other regions in the frontal lobe, temporal lobe, and parietal lobe. After eight weeks of treatment, his anterior cingulate cortex was only functionally connected with the anterior insula, which is part of the salience network, which you can see down here. So it's been hypothesized that enhancements in functional connectivity seen in mild TBI patients may reflect a kind of compensatory process. So it's conceivable that this reduction in functional connectivity between the anterior cingulate cortex and other regions of the brain in this patient after eight weeks of treatment may be a result of a diminished need for compensatory processes as the brain function normalizes with PBM. So after the eight weeks of treatment, his headaches improved a bit. Uh, on the HIT scale, he went from a 76 to a 70, which is still severe. Um, after the, the post-treatment assessment, hockey season was over, so he uh, moved out of the country, and we didn't have an opportunity to get him back for a third time point. But I did administer the HIT questionnaire to him 14 months later, and um, at that time, he reported that his headaches had improved. On the HIT scale, it was a 50. Um, he hadn't been playing hockey in the intervening 14 months. Um, he reports that he was still using the V-Lite device, but off and on only when he remembered or felt like it. So it's kind of difficult to say whether his headaches improved because of, the, of using the PBM device or because he hadn't been playing hockey and hadn't been hit in 14 months. Unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to test him cognitively or look at his brain function. Um, but you know, 14 months later, he's still using the device off and on and his headaches are better. So um, that's all I have. I'll thank you for your attention and take any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Linda. Very intriguing. Go ahead. If you want, you can also stop sharing so we can see everybody. Excellent. Yeah. I heard someone asking oh, a question, sorry. Paula. Yeah. Hi, Paula. I, I was just curious, Linda, did you have, did he have a cavum septum pellucidum? Because that could be affecting his memory issues um, if he had them. I I didn't hear, I had to step away for a second. Yeah, but. Um, not that we're aware of. Okay, okay. Linda, I had a question about the treatments in this case. Uh, so were these treatments uh, uh, daily? I might have missed that with the V-Lite or were they two or three times a week? It was every other day. Every other day. Mm -hmm. um, excellent. Um, you know, it's, it's fascinating uh, that you're showing with this uh, um, fairly low power device uh, um, effects uh, that are very distant, uh, um, like um, from, from the light source, uh, like in the hippocampus uh, um, and the, the improvement in, in uh, uh, gray matter volumes uh, at the hippocampal level as well. Um, and uh, I don't know if there's any speculation about the, the mechanism of that uh, or any thoughts. Yeah, it's. It's hard to say with one 
one patient, you know, but people have, have shown, um, I think um, Mike Hamlin's group has shown that uh, PBM can help um, help um, neur neuronal regeneration. Is that right, Marnie? Am I remembering that correctly? Well, yes, he showed that there's in mice um, increased brain derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. And uh, well, that was after treating the mice in, a, in acute TBI. He waited four hours after dropping the weight on the head and then uh, started treating the whole head, really, because it's a mouse. And um, so at seven days, he found this increase in BDNF. And then at 28 days, he found this increase in synapsin 1. So it was at different times post that traumatic brain injury in these mice uh, that he found these different um, factors. Uh, I wanted to say, did, did you have any more comments on that? I had another question or comment. Uh, no, I just, uh, you know, as a follow up to, to your comment, Marty. Uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I guess you have to assume that uh, these neurotrophins are uh, then circulating and, and affecting other areas of the brain, because obviously you, you're, we don't expect any light to get there through the hippocampus. And you're dealing with intrinsic networks anyway. And you're, um, you know, you treated the default mode network with the V-light neuro alpha and gamma. So those it's actually a different network, but then the salience network was just where you found your new organization, which is great. Um, supposedly then drives the default mode network. So there must be a lot of reciprocal connections in there, according to the Bonnell papers. Um, I also um, wanted yeah. to mention that, you know, they're using the intranasal as well, which may um, get to the olfactory bulbs, which have connections to the hippocampus. So it's possible that through functional connections, we're getting there as well. And I had one other, yes, I agree with that, of course. Uh, I had one other comment. I wanted to explain a little bit more for the people in the audience who may not be that familiar with the V-Lite neuro devices. So um, you started out with the V-Lite neuro gamma, which pulses at 40 pulses per second. And uh, I don't remember saying that I thought I felt like I was getting a head cold when I used the gamma, but um, it is, uh, I will say, um, will wake up the brain. Let's just put it that way. And there is a paper, a very nice paper by uh, Reza Zalmarodi, uh, published in 2019 in um, Science Reports, Scientific Reports, whatever it is. And um, he studied EEG, but he studied it um, with people who were healthy, but I think they were 61 years old to 74. So that's his population. And um, when he studied the EEG before and after, um, when he did the neurogamma, which is pulsed at 4.0, 40 Hertz, he found that it increased um, the power on the uh, 40 Hertz, uh, the gamma wavelengths, uh, alpha wavelengths, and decreased uh, theta and delta. So that's sort of one good reason why it seems to be more stimulating. And in your patient here, that's so interesting, but I've, we've heard about this from other studies, it's not particularly in our studies, but that um, they can, that 40 Hertz um, is a bit much and they report increase in their headaches. So he was a, an example of that, as I understand it from reading your paper, which I think is a wonderful paper. Um, then you switched him over to the alpha, which only is still going to treat the default mode network, um, but only at 10 hertz. And according to the Zomorodi et al. 2019 paper, is only going to increase power of alpha. So as I understand it, that helped him. Uh, in terms of, well, certainly not getting headaches anymore, making them worse. And then he, prim did he primarily stay with just that v light So for the, alpha? for the, for the rest of the, the, the treatments, v light told them to alternate between them. So oh, so we alternated back and alpha, forth. Alpha, one day he used the gamma. Oh, okay. So yeah. Did he treat Monday, Wednesday, Friday? I'm still not. I gather that's what he well, did. Well, every other day. So, yeah. you know, oh, I don't. Every other day, whatever. And you weren't in on yeah. those payment protocols also. And there are so many out there. <laughs> so uh, the issue is that um, I guess eventually, although he still had headaches, uh, you know, even whatever your post-treatment 
uh, testing at eight weeks after these eight weeks of treatment. Uh, and it only went down 14 months later, which is uh, and really interesting to see also. Uh, but at least they didn't get worse. So when he was alternating back and forth. So I just want to let the other people know that um, if they get headaches, and Anita Saltmarsh might have a comment on this too, um, and you were using the 40 hertz, the neurogamma, then you could always consider switching down to the alpha. And you can probably get good results that way too, because they're still reading the, um, still uh, teaching or <laughs> treating, sorry, uh, the, the default mode network, because that's what it's designed to do. Mike. Linda? <laughs> Mike. Hi. Um, I also work with Dr. Nazer, and um, I had a question about your uh, free surfer volumetric measures. Um, we've done a few of those as well, and I was just curious. If you have an idea of how much change is significant. So in the first slide you showed, I think maybe a one or two millimeter cubic millimeter increase. Yeah. It seems pretty small. And like, you know, if you yes. were to repeat it, would you expect to see? You know, yeah, I mean, results? these are tiny, tiny changes in one patient mm -hmm. and it's within the, the, um, the range of measurement error. So I don't know if I repeated it, you know, if, if, we'd see it, you know, obviously you have to take this with a grain of salt. It's one person, you know, on, on the MRI two months apart. So. I was gonna follow up and ask if you had done more um, participants, uh, done more MRI in, in anybody else. So just curious. We've uh, done imaging in um, dementia patients. Um, yeah, I don't think we saw, so with the dementia patients in some people we see volume increases and in some people we see volume decreases, you know, with older people with dementia, it's hard to tell, you know, how much of that is noise, how much of that is, they move obviously more than young, healthy people. And, um, you know, it's just, it's hard to tell about a, a big, huge, properly powered study. Sure. And then also with aging, you, you're you uh, dealing with a decrease in volume anyway. So, you know, if mm -hmm. you're seeing a decrease in volume, is it a less decrease, you know, than right. they would have had? Exactly. So, yeah. Thanks. I have a follow up uh, that kind of goes with that question. It, the I'm looking at the slide from the, the PBM's effects on brain perfusion. And, you know, the numbers are perfusion, arbitrary units, uh, you know, 0 0.6 to, you know, point, 0 0.8 and one. And you think that that is also within the level of standard error? Um, it could be um, the perfusion, you know, you've got, you've got, um, um, yeah, it, it certainly could be, but I have also found increased perfusion after PBM treatments in dementia patients. And there have been, other reports of uh, transcranial PBM increasing the cerebral blood flow. So um, that I, I'm, I'm a little bit more confident in than well, the volume increases. Could you also speak to the kind of the effects that the occipital region was that had like one of the highest perfusion changes, yet the connectivity and salience were more in the anterior part of the brain? Any idea on that? Yeah, I, you know, it's one patient. I, I, I don't really know. Although I think in the Tedford, or was it the, uh, the, the Jackson, one of the, the studies looking at how deeply the lights can penetrate the, the skull and scalp. I think the occipital cortex was one of the, the regions that where, where the lights can penetrate more deeply than I know the temporal and frontal lobes are, are more difficult to penetrate. So, you know, like, it kind of goes with, with that story. And that, uh, I think that, the, I have a question. You're the author of these two great papers and they seem pretty amazing to me that the hippocampus buying can change and perfusion can go up and we have lots of good documentation on that. What's been sort of the down, what have you, what have people come back to you and said, other researchers, other clinicians, that's kind of a, you know, hey, we're put light on the head and grow the brain and increase the perfusion. Have, have you, has it had the impact? Have you had the re response that to, you thought you would get from really groundbreaking type of research? Such a great um, 
I, I gave a grand round to the Memory and Aging Center at UCSF where I talked about, and that was like a huge thing because um, I don't know how many people um, in this group know Julio Rojas, but he worked, uh, uh, um, he did his, he's an MD PhD. He did this dissertation looking at the mechanisms of PBM and he's a neurologist at the uh, Memory and Aging Center. And he's been talking to them about PBM for years and you know, he says that they won't listen. So it was, it was kind of amazing. I got a very warm and, and open reception when I, but I didn't talk about these two studies, you know, with such small ends, you know, these are clinicians who are used to doing clinical trials with hundreds of patients. So I talked about uh, the, the dementia study and it got a, a warm, you know, polite reception, but you know, no one's beaten down my door to try this. You know, Lida, I was interested about uh, the 10 uh, Hertz and 40 Hertz alter alternation. And uh, it's something that I've seen increasingly in, in patients in our clinic uh, uh, that they somewhat um, adjust and, and, and may also even combine in the same day, uh, 10 Hertz and 40 Hertz uh, to gain different effects, uh, whether it's uh, energizing effects or, or effects on mood to lift the mood or more calming, relaxing uh, for sleep. So it's interesting to see this case, at least at a different periods, they had to switch one from one to the other and got benefits from both. So uh, it's very uh, telling. Uh, and also I had a kind of follow-up questions uh, about the veterans. And I was curious about, you mentioned their history of alcohol abuse. Um, do you know if they also were, um, they were, they were drinking excessively at the time when uh, uh, you did the, the testing? Uh, or, oh, no. Or no. no, that was in the past. So yeah, people who do my studies, um, they can't have current alcohol abuse or dependence. And to be eligible for the study, it has to be, you know, at least three years in, in the past. So, so they were not currently drinking. Do you know if they experienced cravings? Uh, I don't know if they reported uh, any of that. Uh, um... I, I, I do not think so, but I, I didn't specifically. You know, they weren't... Yeah, um, if I recall, the the alcohol history is in their like past, you know, like a long time ago. Not they weren't recent recovering alcoholics. Right, right. No, and I see Fred is here as well. Of course, I'm thinking at uh, the data on opioid cravings and transcranial photobiomodulation in other groups like uh, Victoria Campbell and veterans uh, um, described uh, anecdotally uh, that uh, there is a reduction in uh, also alcohol consumption. Uh, so I wonder if uh, uh, there was any hint uh, of an effect uh, outside, uh, uh, you know, the kind of the traditional knowledge of opioid cravings and the effect of PBM on cravings in general. But it seems like they were not uh, experiencing any of that. And so it wasn't informative from that standpoint. Right. I had a question. Um, so it's really nice to see that on your functional uh, resting state functional connectivity uh, data, uh, you showed, you know, there's sort of this chaos in the beginning and then at the end you have the salience network uh, connectivity anterior insula and um, the anterior cingulate cortex. It's really beautiful. I wanted to know, <clears throat> did you try to put a seed point, for example, which is not going to be very far away from the anterior cingulate in mesial prefrontal cortex. And did you see any <clears throat> change in connectivity within the default mode network itself? Because that's actually where you're putting these, you know, four cortical diodes on the head and then of course indirectly to the hippocampus. So I was wondering if you had any comments or information yeah. about changes in default mode network. I looked in default mode network. I didn't. I didn't see anything. You know, it was. Um, there wasn't much difference before and after. And uh, the anterior cingulate and the mesial prefrontal that you're talking about, they are so close together. And I'm not sure. You know, with the the, the diode, you know, right here on the head, if right. you could really target those two regions differentially and depending on where he places it each time you know I'm not sure that right you're and he's doing it at home and yeah. I'm thinking that too because um you know we're doing some work with football players and um the anterior cingulate seems to be you know coming up more so somewhat on our functional connectivity 
And um, I'm wondering, I guess, even though we think <laughs> we're targeting um, mesial prefrontal cortex, but they're so close together, um, it's possible we're doing both um, at the same time. And um, it, it, I was very interested to see your salience network. Um, crystal clear. I mean, that's just incredible. Yeah. yeah. And of course, your seed point is um, in the middle. You're getting left and right into your mm -hmm. at the same mm -hmm. time. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, uh, you've been doing wonderful work. It's a, a, actually pretty amazing. Uh, I, I, I would suggest uh, that um, uh, you uh, try to find some more patients and, and I would just measure their um, uh, outcome. Uh, and then uh, if, if, if uh, because that's easier to do, it's less expensive. And, and if you can get 10 patients where you're showing an improvement in sleep or, or whatever parameter, um, 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 uh, you know, th then you can, you know, I think you could apply for a grant and, and, and do, it, do a more expensive study where you find out what the mechanism is. But the most important thing is that it helps people. And, and, and these are great data. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's, it's just initially I thought home treatment would be the way to go. And for these first couple of pilot studies, I, I really babysat handheld the patients, you know, was constantly calling them, checking on them. Um, Julio Rojas and I did a, a follow-up pilot, a follow-up study with dementia patients using the device. It is really hard to track people that they're using it properly, using the devices properly, and when should, you know, when they're at home. It's easier when they're at home, but, you know, you kind of have to take their word for it, and, you know, it's it's just, it's really hard to, to, to track that they're using it properly with COVID and factors. Uh, yes, sometimes. Um, and some people, some people, you know, they're calling you all the time. The lights blinking, there's a, the alarms going off. What does this mean? Other people, they're like, I got it. I know how to use it. And then you don't know if they really do or not. And so it's, it's really hard to, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to get people to come in you know, a couple times a week to treat them, but then you know you're doing it right. And then you send them home with it, you know, you have to trust that they're they're really doing what you're telling them to do, you know, and you FaceTime them a couple times a week, but you know, you're not there. And so they they really, I talked to Lou Lim about doing some kind of um, telemetry or something where you can track the use and the motion. Um, I think you really need something like that for, for this home treatment to, to take off for clinical trials. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. We have exactly the same experience you do when we give it to the patients at home, following them up and making sure that they're doing it properly. And again, the same issue. Some patients call you all the time asking questions and making sure they're doing it right. And some patients are like, I don't need to worry about it. And so I agree, some kind of telemetry would be really good. Yeah. yeah. Excuse me. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the earlier part because I was trying to log in, log in, keep trying, keep trying, and then missed the, the earlier part. So which unit did you have for them to take home? So for the golfer veterans, it was the V-Lite Alpha. And for the hockey player, he started off with the Gamma. And when that gave him headaches, V-Lite sent him like a dual, which is basically the Alpha and the Gamma, and he alternated between the two. So how much is the unit? I mean, did you buy the unit and give to them? I mean, um, so for the Gopher veterans, we did buy the units and gave it to them. Um, for the hockey player, v -Light gave it to them. So, yeah. So, so how much is the average price for that? Unit? It's about $1,800. $1, I think it's like $1,850 or something. So under $2,000. Per one. If you get the yes. duo, I think... It's, 2, over 2, it's a better deal if you get the duo because then you can, I mean, for example, another way of looking at this, uh, you might want to do the gamma uh, in the morning or early in the day because that's going to, you know, make a big change in, in the gamma waves and the alpha waves and, and sort of suppress uh, theta and delta. But then some people might want to do the alpha, you know, at least with six hours separation time in the evening. So that that's more relaxing because it's just going to be alpha, but it is still the default mode network um, on both of them. So that's that's the question. I think that's the right price. If Anita's on, she might be able to know the prices better. The duo's twenty three forty nine. 
Uh-huh. Oh, they made a lot of money. <laughs> 1700 is what I thought. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I thought the- 1749 uh, for the either alpha or gamma and 2349 or 79 for the duo. Um, I have, could I have another oh, question? Sure, Hamdi, go ahead. About hair. So mm -hmm. how much, I mean, from, from all your experience, what kind of uh, impression you get? And now if we get to the quantitative issue, that's a different way to discuss about measurement. But just overall now, in terms of uh, light hair or thin hair or no hair, versus the one who just happened to have uh, uh, thick hair. How do you deal with those different, con I mean, different conditions of hair? I mean, how much it would affect the treatment? Yeah, um, Marty can speak to this. I mean, what we do with the V-Lite is we just tell people to, to try to, you know, position the, the diodes as close to the scalp as possible, make sure it's not sitting on hair, you know, try to part the hair. And again, with the home treatment, you have no, I, you, you do this when you train them. So with the home treatment protocol, what I did was I trained people how to do it while they were in the lab. They took it home for a week. And then a week later, I went back to make sure they're still doing it properly. And then sometimes you find out that they're doing it completely wrong and putting it on backwards and then you correct them. Um, and then they're they're on their own for the rest of the two months or three months or whatever. Um, and you just, we tell them to try to, part the hair and make sure it's sitting on the scalp as closely as possible, you know, but some people have a lot more hair than others. You know, some people are bald, like you say, and, and yeah, so it's not, it's probably different in everybody and probably different each time, depending on how carefully, you know, they're positioning the device. Thank you. I agree with that. I mean, you have to be really careful. Um, it's it, working at the VA or most of our patients are men, but we did have a woman who, she had very thick uh, sort of dark blonde hair, and we were treating her with the Thor helmet, which is red and near infrared LEDs all over the head and down the sides of the neck, um, and I didn't think she did as well as the others that were mostly men, uh, because she just had all this hair. We did part, you know, a midline part, so we could at least get more direct LED application, at least to uh, mesial prefrontal cortex and all along the mid sagittal sinus area and back to precuneus and whatnot. But I think the sides of her head, I wonder if she ever got any photons in there. We don't have any um, really good imaging. We do really don't have imaging yet. So um, at least in her case. So I, I really wor do worry about that. And I worry about it in um, women, especially because they're gonna come to you with very thick hair, especially on the sides. So I think it's something to really keep in mind. Mike Hamlin has always told us that you'll never get those photons through the hair. And you know, I think he's right about that. With the mice, it's interesting what he said about that. Well, you can always spray the hair with water and um, separate it, and make sure you can get down on the scalp. But I'm not sure, I don't know if you could get that through an IRB or something. I, I'm just not sure. So we never tried to deal with it that way. But I agree, you have to part it, and try, try your best to get it on the skin. The, the mesial prefrontal cortex is pretty easy because you just go up midline from the nose and at the junction with the front hairline is your target. So that one you can, you know, pretty much not have on hair. But then this high parietal precuneus, I mean, that's usually, it, it's going to land where this, you know, sagittal uh, suture line comes back and joins the lambdoid suture lines. And it's a real indentation on the scalp. And, you know, you can teach them about that and try to make sure they separate the hair there. But I agree with you. <laughs> the ones for the angular gyrus or interparietal sulcus, who knows what's happening on the V-light neuro gamma or alpha placements for default mode networks there. It's uh, a mystery. But anyway, yes, hair is something that's really important to keep in mind. And Linda, I had a question following on Marnie's comment in terms of time of the day. Um, do you know when they were using the device, uh, whether the 10 hertz or the 40 hertz, were they using a specific time of the day? No, we didn't instruct them to use it. Uh, we, we said the best thing would be to try to always treat at the same time of day, you know, mm -hmm. always in the morning or always in the evening. 
I don't know if they did that, you know, and I said, if you can't stick to that schedule, you know, treating is better than not treating, you know, if you treat, typically treat in the morning, but something happened and, you know, then if you forget treat at night, don't not treat because it's not in the morning. So I, you know, they didn't, I, I had them have a diary, but I, you know, it's like the same thing with sleep diaries. You know, you never really know if they're actually diligently filling it out as they go along or if they just filled it out, you know, right before they sent it to you or came into the lab. So again, that's just something, that's another thing you can't control when you don't have people come into your lab to treat. And did they uh, report any side effects or, or maybe any unexpected experiences, maybe favorable, um, anything that came up? Yeah, no one has, no one has, um, the dementia patients or this hockey player or the Gulf War veterans, no one has reported any adverse side effects. I mean, the only thing, the only complaints I've had is they don't like the nasal clip and the V-Light, you know, headset, it, it pinches their, their, their heads or their ears or something. It's all with the, the setup, not, not with the lights. No one's complained about the lights, which is good. In your dementia patients, uh, what's your impression about wh whether there's improvement or not? Um, in general, I, I, I find improvements. In, in some cases, it's dramatic. There was one lady I remember, um, she said it was like she got her husband back. He had, he had dementia and, and it, he was going to an adult daycare center where he saw the flyer for my study and he brought it home and told her he wanted to do the study. So she supported him. And she said that um, after using the device for a couple of weeks, she could watch a 30 minute TV show with him again and they could converse about it. And she hadn't been able to do that in years. Hmm. Other people, you know, they show improvement on pencil and paper testing. So their scores on the CVLT or the ADAS COG is a few points better, but their loved ones don't notice anything dramatic. You know, hmm. they're still forgetful. They're still constantly asking. So, so there's a big range and um, it's hard to say why exactly that is. Hmm. Was the dementia diagnosis uh, um, genetically the same? Was it, were these all cases of Alzheimer's? Or? Yeah, so in the, 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 the pilot study that I, I published, um, I did that on my own. So I just recruited patients who had diagnoses of dementia. And you know, you know, if they're diagnosed by a primary care physician, they'll most likely say Alzheimer's because it's the most common type of dementia. For the follow-up study that I did with Julio Rojas, because he's a neurologist, and we also got pa patients from the Memory and Aging Center. So these were all people with biomarker confirmed AD diagnosis. And COVID threw a real monkey wrench into that study. So we're still like analyzing the data. Um, we lost some people, you know, they didn't want to come back in for follow-up testing because of COVID or, you know, and so, so we'll see that study is with the gamma, which is supposed to be better for people with dementia and they're all Alzheimer's. So we'll see what that study shows. Okay. A home treatment at home? Yes. Home treatment. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. There's a few people, um, it was every other day. And the interesting thing, um, you always said that we should treat MCI because you think that we'll, uh, the Alzheimer's might be, if they're too, too severely demented, it'd be hard to show, um, show change. So it was interesting with the MCI patients, and you might want to take note of this, Paolo, for your study, they're less, so because we're doing biomarker confirmation, a lot of these people were very mild MCI, but they had amyloid. So according to the Memory and Aging Center, they, they had Alzheimer's because they had amyloid, but they were so, so mildly impaired that they were basically, you know, on their own, right? Their loved ones would bring them in to the clinic, sign them up for the study, but they were on their own for the treatments. And so they've got MCI, so they're forgetful. And I'm trying to get their husband or wife to help them remember to use the device, but they're not as actively involved in their care yet because they're not that impaired. So it was really difficult with the MCI cases. They weren't as impaired, but they were, you know, not so severely impaired that they're not taking care of themselves. So but they're still forgetful, so yeah. That is very tricky. I know yeah. we, we are at the end, very end. Uh, um, if I wanted to mention about Anita, Anita's study because she did have MMSE scores, just for Fred's question. Um, and uh, in that paper, she had five cases and there are many, many mental state exam scores were 10 uh, to 19 out of 30 on those questions, if you wanted. And they did 
okay, they did well, they improved. And as soon as you took the equipment away, it was, um, it was alpha and it was 10 hertz. It was the first paper. Um, they fell apart. So these neurodegenerative progressive cases will do better if you continue, can continue the treatment. Um, that's our comment on that. Thanks. Well, wonderful. Um, thank you so much, uh, Linda, uh, for presenting your work. It's really fascinating. And thank you all for participating today. Um, and uh, uh, keep coming. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you all. You. Bye -bye. Thank you. Nice to see you guys. Nice to see, see you, Linda. It's great. Bye, Linda. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.